Good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year, and welcome back to campus. I hope that you all had an enjoyable winter break. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Ann Mitchell, and I am the director for Health Services. We are all well aware of the opioid epidemic and how it is plaguing our nation. It's dangerous, full-blown, and does not discriminate. It can affect people of all walks of life and any age. More than 130 people in the United States die each day from an accidental opioid overdose. In Rhode Island alone, 323 individuals lost their lives in 2017. This issue has become a public health national crisis with devastating consequences. We need to be proactive in our efforts to combat this crisis. The training you are receiving today is an important step for the Roger Williams community, that's you and I, to demonstrate our commitment to doing something about the growing epidemic. Roger Williams University is taking the lead on addressing this crisis by supporting campus-wide training on opioid overdose prevention and making naloxone more readily available throughout campus. I would like to personally thank President Workman and Dr. John King for supporting this initiative. A special thank you to student-led groups, the John Jay Society, and health and wellness educators for their efforts in bringing overdose intervention training to this campus. And thank all of you for participating in this program. I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker. Michelle McKenzie is a public health researcher at the Miriam Hospital, Brown Alpert Medical School. Her focus for the last 12 years has been on opioid overdose prevention. She is co-founder of Pony, Preventing Overdose and Naloxone Intervention, which began in 2006. Last year, Pony distributed more than 6,500 naloxone kits to Rhode Islanders. She sits on the Governor's Overdose Prevention Task Force and co-chairs the Naloxone Work Group. Please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thank you so much, Anne. So wait, you guys can hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you so much, and it has been a pleasure. I've got to spend the day here, and it has been really great. And I um, appreciated so much the students who attended this morning session, um, and I am delighted to be here this afternoon. So what I'm gonna do today is um, provide an, a background of the issue of opioid addiction and opioid overdose death here in Rhode Island, uh, focus more on what's happening in Rhode Island, but I can say that this is really a problem across the country. And I'd like to also point out that while I'm gonna be focusing on, focusing on opioids because in fact that, is, as Anne said, is what is causing really um, a crisis of fatalities in our country right now. It is a bigger issue of addiction, um, and uh, particularly alcohol plays a, an important role in that. Um, other substances play an important role. And for the first time, really, in the history of our country, um, for the last two years, the CDC has, um, has found that we are, our life expectancy in this country has shortened. Um, not by a lot, thank goodness, a couple of months. But in fact, because of the diseases of addiction and suicide, what they're calling the diseases of despair, we're actually having shorter lives as a result of that. So this is, it's, it's so important that college campuses take this on, you know, head on, and that is, so it, it, it's great to be part of the work that you're here doing here at Roger Williams University. Um, so I'm going to give, again, we're, I'm going to be focusing on opioids, we're going to give a background, and then also and we're going to do a sort of more hands-on how to prevent, recognize, and intervene, and I have naloxone kits available today for anyone who would like it. Okay, um, so there have been multiple waves of the epidemic that really began in the mid-90s with increased prescribing of prescription opioids for acute and chronic pain. And I, I'm not gonna get into the details of that because there's a, there's a lot of factors that were involved with that, but um, basically beginning in um, 95, 96, um, in response to real concerns by folks who were suffering with cancer and end of life, 
that there needed to be um, more aggressive treatment of pain for folks in these uh, specific conditions. Um, there was, um, you know, the insurance companies, the doctors, et cetera, and the pharmaceutical companies, importantly, people came together and said, okay, we're going to more aggressively treat pain. The, um, method by which it was chosen to do that is prescription opioids. And one of the things that really fueled that was um, Purdue Pharma in 96, very aggressively marketed OxyContin. And um, marketed it in a way uh, to say that it was good for everyday pain. Now, opioids play a very important role in managing pain. There is no question about that. Um, but they, it is not meant to treat everyday pain. Um, and so uh, OxyContin really had, uh, was, did unprecedented marketing of this product. That, in, in, along with policies that were, um, I'll just say that there, part of it was a siloed, our siloed medical system, sort of not, uh, physicians not being trained in addiction medicine, not understanding the consequences of um, opioid use disorder or opioid addiction. Um, the, really the look for the magic bullet, right? We, we're, that's kind of, we're used to that. We are looking for the magic bullet. And so that was what um, opioid pain relievers were perceived to be. And so there was a wholesale adoption of using prescription opioids to treat pain for basically about 15 years, from the mid-90s to to mid 2000s, um, end 2000s, and what we saw was that as the increase of prescription, if there was an increase in prescription opioids, we also saw an increase of fatalities with the same slope um, of people who were dying having non-fatal overdoses and fatal overdoses from prescription opioids. It took a while for the medical establishment to recognize that there were these unintended, unintended consequences as a result of using opioids so much for acute and chronic pain. And I'm going to take a, just a moment to explain. Opioids work. Are, are folks familiar with opioids? What are some examples of opioids? Vicodin. Vicodin. That's a good example. It's another Percocet, Oxycontin, morphine. Morphine has been around forever. Uh, opium, opium, heroin, these are all examples of, well, not, heroin's not prescription opium. Well, heroin used to be available, actually, uh, in the early 1900s, not prescribed, but it was available legally. Um, so there was, uh, what opioids do is they attach to the opioid receptors in the body. So everybody has naturally occurring opioids. Um, and so they attach to the opioid receptors and they do what they do. They, um, and one part of the central nervous system that they work on is the limbic system. So people that, which causes feelings of relaxation and contentment. So in addition to doing, um, treating, uh, working on the brain stem and treating pain, there's also this uh, other feeling. It's sedating and it also can be euphoric. Um, and while the vast majority of people who use prescription opioids will not have a problem with it, right? That's, that's real. Most people who use it won't have a problem. But if you think about that in mid-1990s, where there were very few people who were being exposed to prescription opioids at all, so the number, I will say, heroin, particularly in Rhode Island, has been around forever, right? So we've had a problem with heroin, but we're starting out with prescription opioids now. So there was this, there, the number of people who had access to prescription op opioids was low. So while it is true that the vast majority of people won't have a problem with prescription opioids, people who are at risk of develop, um, developing a problem, the more people who are exposed to it, the more people who are also at risk, right? So and when you have exponential growth of the access to prescription opioids, not only through uh, be it being prescribed, so we're seeing it, you know, we particularly in this time frame being prescribed for um, any kind of acute pain, broken arm, uh, surgery, of course, um, having your teeth extracted, et cetera, et cetera, being prescribed both from emergency rooms and from urgent care centers being widely used for chronic pain, for which it's not really meant to be used for. Um, 
And we saw that what it was doing is people would take home their prescriptions, their opioid prescriptions, and it would be in the cabinet. And then many more people had access to it. Because if you think about it, if I'm being prescribed something that is good for me, you know, it's supposed to be good for me, I don't have to worry about it because these warnings were not happening then, then why would it be for good for you, right? And so it is, was the case that people shared their medication, uh, but also that people, that they didn't necessarily share it, but that it was accessed from their um, bathroom cabinets. So we had not only all of the prescribing that was happening, but all of the folks who had, had access to those prescription opioids that were in people's homes. So by the late 2000, 2010, around 2010, 2012, that particularly by 2012 here in Rhode Island, there was this recognition of the unintended consequences of having all of these prescription opioids out in the world. And so there was a real focus to start reining that in. But one of the things when I talked about um, that we all, the, the, what opioids do is they attach to the opioid receptors. Um, a thing that happens, and it, it, this happens with alcohol and it happens with opioids, if you use opioids over time, um, you actually change the neurotransmitters in the brain and so you develop a tolerance or dependence to opioids. Let me ask, have anybody, has anybody seen those commercials, those truth commercials out now, right? And so do you know what the tagline at the end is, uh, I think, dependence in five days? Um, those so that's, of course, individual. It's not going to be the same for everybody. But it is true that if you use an opioid for an extended period of time, um, your brain chemistry changes. And you need that opioid. If you start taking, if you just all of a sudden stop taking it, since your receptors are like, wait, where is that? I need that opioid. You're going to get sick. So my mom had um, a surgery. She had to take, um, she had, it was a big surgery. She had scoliosis and had a titanium rod in her back. She had to be on OxyContin for weeks. And so if she had stopped that OxyContin all at once, she would have gotten sick because she had developed a tolerance to it. And that is just a physiological thing that happens when you take opioids over a long period of time. Um, but she was able to um, taper or wean when in conjunction with her physician who took her off a little bit at a time. And so she did not experience um, withdrawal symptoms. So withdrawal is when you uh, if you stop, you've developed a, t a dependence or tolerance, and you stop all at once, you're going to get really sick. Who, who has, anybody heard of withdrawal? So what, what does it do? What is it, Physi what are symptoms of withdrawal? Okay, exactly. All of those things. It's like a super intense flu. So now think about this. So people, here's the setting, right? People have been, uh, particularly folks on chronic medication, they're treating their chronic pain, they've been on opioids for ever how long, maybe months, maybe longer, and now there's a in really intense scrutiny on people getting too much prescription opioids, right? So one of the uh, consequences is that they're, honestly, we're still struggling with this right now, not having a super well thought out plan about how are we gonna address it for people who are struggling with dependence and maybe addiction. Um, if we take those medications away, what's gonna happen? Exactly right. That's exactly right. So people will first look to uh, get other prescription uh, opioids either from friends or family, then maybe from the street, but honestly, heroin was cheaper. Right? And heroin was more potent. And so there was sort of, by 2012 in this state, what we saw, let's see. So what this graph shows us is that by 2012 in this state, we actually had a shift. That gray line was fatalities um, related to prescription opioids. And we see that leveling off and decreasing. But the yellow line is from illicit opioids. And in 2012, illicit opioids were heroin. Um, and there was a very dramatic increase in overdose deaths. 
And in part, the reason for that is that when people shift from uh, using a prescription medication where they know exactly what the dose is, they know exactly what they're getting, to the illicit market where there's no information about what you're getting. And to um, confirm that even more is that even by 2012, and most certainly by 2015, our illicit um, drug supply was really radically changing. Um, so there had been examples of fentanyl. So who's heard of fentanyl? OK, what is it? You all raise your hand. Somebody knows this. It's, it's a strong, OK, this is declarate. So fentanyl is a very strong medi uh, pain medication. It's used in very specific circumstances. Um, and it is true, there is absolutely pharmaceutical grain fit grade fentanyl, and it has been used, you know, diverted for a long time too. But the fentanyl that I'm talking about here is actually completely synthetic uh, fentanyl that is uh, created abroad and enters the drug supply stream. It is, uh, it's all illicit. So these are made and uh, not made at the pharmacy. So it's not, so it's not uh, fentanyl that you know what the dose is, that you know what you're getting. So both the heroin and the fentanyl is being manufactured illicitly and entering the drug supply. So by 2015, by the final quarter of 2015, what we'd see, we saw was a shift from most overdoses being attributable to heroin they're now attributable to fentanyl. And we've been in that um, wave, if you will, that wave of the crisis for the last several years. So we now have a super saturated opioid um, drug supply of fentanyl. There's barely any heroin. And part of the reason that that's ca the case is that economically, it just doesn't make as much sense. Heroin has to be grown. The poppy seeds have to be grown, harvested, produced. Fentanyl is 50 times more potent than heroin, so you need much less of the drug. Um, so for it, truly for supply side reasons, that is the manufacturers said, okay, there's, we have this huge market and there is, a, there is a drug that is more potent, cheaper to make, and easier to get into the country. And so we now have really the opioid supply is completely saturated. Now, this is not happening in all geographic regions. Um, the West Coast, for instance, is not being as impacted by fentanyl as we are. Um, but along the Northeast Corridor and the Appalachian, we have been completely um, saturated. Um, so Anne mentioned this earlier. Um, what I hope was the height of the um, fatalities and that we are on a downward, a permanent downward trend was in 2016, we lost 336 people to overdose in Rhode Island. So that's almost a person a day. Um, and there had been a, as you saw in the earlier graph, there had been just increasing every year the number of people who died from overdose. In 2017, for the first time in over a decade, we actually saw a slight decrease. It certainly is not enough, but we are seeing at least the correct trend is to be going down. In 2018, we don't have all the numbers yet, but it looks like that we will, we will have fewer than 323 deaths. We are just not exactly sure how many, but expecting, again, a slight decrease. So this graph, just, or just this uh, map, just shows that there's literally not a city or town in Rhode Island that hasn't been impacted by this epidemic. Um, everyone has lost. Uh, every city and town in the country, uh, state, rather, has lost someone. Um, and uh, if this is, this is the number of people who died, non-fatal overdoses are actually exponentially larger than this, and certainly, uh, again, is an issue in every city and town. OK. So, you know how I mentioned that we're in the third wave of the epidemic? Um, so the first being sort of the increased use of prescription opioids, then shifting to illicit. At, that, at the beginning, it was heroin, um, and now it's fentanyl. 
we may be in the fourth wave. So what we saw in 2017, and we don't have the numbers for 2018 yet, was there was a 30% increase in cocaine overdoses, uh, fatalities, where there was no other opioid with the cocaine except for fentanyl. So the thought was that is that there are uh, drugs are being contaminated with fentanyl unknown by perhaps even the dealer and definitely the user. And so, um, of course, people who have a tolerance for fentanyl because they regularly use um, the uh, use uh, opioids from the illicit drug uh, opioid supply, they have, okay, they have a tolerance for fentanyl. People who do not have a tolerance and have, take a substance that is not, an, you know, they, they think you're taking cocaine or methamphetamine or molly or ecstasy or, um, and it has fentanyl in it, they are at very high risk of overdose because their body does not have tolerance for the opioid, for the fentanyl that is in that substance. So that is, there's a lot of focus now on stimulants and the possibility of them being contaminated with fentanyl. Um, but but I, I want to point out that almost all fatalities have multiple drugs in their system. Um, one of the uh, a, a risk factor for having an overdose is using uh, mixing drugs. And if you think about it, opioids slow your breathing down. Um, and if you take another drug that's a downer, like um, benzodiazepines and alcohol, or alcohol or and alcohol, you're having a multiplying effect on your breathing, uh, on, your, on your respiratory system. Um, but even if you take a stimulant, so opioids and stimulants, um, that overwhelms the body and increases the risk of overdose. So this graph just shows the degree to which fentanyl and this is, again, the, the year for which we have uh, the latest data um, is, is, a, is at issue. 70% of deaths in 2017 were related to fentanyl, of overdose deaths. Okay. So are there any, before I get into this, are there any questions about sort of the bigger picture? Okay, I was so clear. I'm glad. Um, I will say, I, I Towards the end, uh, in a few more slides, um, I'm going to show uh, a, website, a website called Prevent Overdose RI. Prevent Overdose RI. This is a fantastic website. If people are interested in this issue, want to know um, about treatment availability, want to know about getting naloxone, want to know about uh, any statistics in the state about fatal or non fatal overdoses, um, what to do in case of an overdose, all of that information is on the website, and I'll show you in a little bit. Including the governor's um, strategic plan, which is to reduce overdose deaths in the state, and there's a four-prong strategic plan, and one of those prongs is to increase access to naloxone, um, which you guys are doing today. Um, another prong is increase access to medication um, Addiction, uh, medication for addiction treatment, um, accessing recovery, and, and really working with prescribers and patients to, um, to address safer opioid prescribing, de decreasing opioid prescribing, um, and embracing alternatives, uh, alternative pain therapies, et cetera. So those are the four prongs of the Governor's Over Overdose Prevention Task Force. Okay. So now is the more hands-on part. Um, are people here interested in getting naloxone? Which, let me show you what I have. Okay, this is a pony kit. This is the kit we gave out about 60, over 6,500 of these last year uh, in 2018. Um, and it is comprised of two intramuscular syringes because this is intramuscularly administered, two one cc doses of naloxone and a cheat sheet. So everything that I'm gonna go over today is included on this cheat sheet. Um, the first, uh, which is this slide right here, this first section is um, 
how to, uh, it talks about the risks of overdose, what increases the risk of overdose, um, and then we'll go through the rest of it. So if I could get someone to help me pass these out. Um, okay, and for everyone who received a kit, um, I need you to fill out. Okay, so here's the deal with naloxone. Naloxone is a prescribed medication. I'm able to distribute the naloxone because of a standing order that the prescriber created. Uh, the prescriber for the standing order is Dr. Jody Rich. He's also the prescriber that created the standing order at the pharmacies. So the naloxone is available at most pharmacies in the state without a prescription because of the standing order. Um, and so you'll see that the label actually is my name because I'm the trainer. Um, and uh, so there's, there's not anything, there's no personal information on there about you, but I do need to be able to contact you in case of a medication recall. Although it's rare, it's possible. And so that's what this piece of paper is. So it's just this first section right here. The other thing that this does is it helps us track, I'm just, it helps us track, I'll sit up here. It helps us track, I, I give the demographic information to the state and it helps track where the naloxone trainings are happening and where the naloxone is being distributed to see if there's a match between what the state is finding in terms of overdoses. Um, okay, so one thing to be aware of, so we're going to start with what, uh, what puts people at risk of an overdose. So one of the things that I was talking about was that if a person that has never used opioids and they use a drug that has fentanyl in it, that puts them at risk of overdose, right? Because they, they have not developed, developed a tolerance to fentanyl. Um, for people who regularly use opioids who have developed a tolerance, their risks are different. So, um, change in or lowered tolerance. So people, you know how I talked about you develop a tolerance over time? Well, actually, your tolerance pretty quickly goes back to baseline. So let's say that I have been using heroin for several weeks, months, and then I get hospitalized and don't have access to heroin, or I get incarcerated and I don't have access to heroin, um, or I decide that I want to go into treatment and I, um, don't go on a medication-assisted treatment, but I go cold turkey. What's going to happen is that the tolerance in my body is going to go back to baseline pretty quickly. And so when, if I return to use, then I cannot use the same amount of drugs that I used before because my body can no longer take that. So that idea of knowing your tolerance is really important in terms of overdose risks. Using alone. So the deal with fentanyl is that it works very quickly in the body. So I've been doing this for a while. And when, um, when I started doing this in 2006, the drug that we were focusing on was heroin. And so if someone is having an overdose from heroin, then what their, um, their body, to the point at which, from the time they take the dose to the time that they have a critical reaction in their body could be up to one to three hours. Like it's not immediate. It could be, but it not very often. It usually took time. So you actually had a little time to intervene. That maybe even if the person used alone, which was never recommended, but if they used alone, maybe somebody would find them. With fentanyl, that's not the case. People have seconds to minutes to intervene because fentanyl works so much more quickly in the body and is so much more potent. And so using alone, there is not going to be time for somebody to find you. A changing administration, um, personal health history. Um, so people who um, have chronic conditions, like uh, the impact their respiratory system, their liver, or their immune system, are going to be at um, have sort of a, a, a lower baseline, as it were, or higher baseline. They're going to be more susceptible to overdose. Um, and this, this deal with the purity or dose. So fentanyl is now part, a regular part of the drug supply, but the thing is, is there's not one kind of fentanyl. 
There's multiple, they're called analogs, and there's uh, identified of more than 50 uh, fentanyl analogs. And basically that means is that the chemical co construction of those all differ slightly, and the potency differ. So the most potent that we know is carfentanil, which fortunately we really haven't seen more than once or twice here in Rhode Island, um, is the most potent. Um, but even sort of the baseline fentanyl is about 50 times more potent than heroin. And so you can imagine that keeping up with exactly what the purity or dose, you can't possibly know what it is because there's no labeling. It doesn't say how many milligrams of X, Y, and Z. Um, and so it, it is variable all the time. Homelessness, of course, um, is, is, uh, is, uh, puts people at risk for a lot of different things, but including, as crazy as this sounds, um, developing a relationship with people are going to new people, new um, areas, it's going to be a different product. And they may or may not be, have the tolerance for that. The number one is when, when I talked about mixing drugs, and we talked about what we saw that in the fatal, um, fatal overdoses are almost always have multiple drugs in the mix. Are there any questions? Okay. So, um, what happens with an overdose is that the breathing just slows and slows and slows, and the body is not getting enough oxygen. And so that's what an overdose looks like, is that you're not getting enough oxygen. Um, so there is um, slow or no breathing. It can sound like um, snoring or gurgling sounds. Your, your skin's gonna change color. You're gonna get blue or ashen, fingertips or lips. Um, cl clammy, pale skin, um, and unresponsive. So uh, opioids are sedating, and so that is an effect that they have is they kind of put people to sleep. And so to determine that a person is not is asleep versus having an overdose is you can try to wake them up and they don't respond. Um, you can do a chest nuggie or sternum rub, which is where you take your knuckles um, and you rub it on the chest bone of the person, because that's your bone on their bone. And if they don't respond to that, they're in trouble, right? Of course, if they're blue, they're in trouble. Um, okay. Okay, so um, the, the first two, 911 and administering the naloxone, or would ideally happen simultaneously. So if you have two people who are there to intervene in case of an overdose, you're gonna both um, call, one person calls 911 and one person administers naloxone. Now I wanna show you the different types of naloxone. So you, in your kit, you have intramuscular administration, which is this. This is called Narcan, and this is a brand name. This is generic, um, and this it, you administer. Here's a little sample of it. You literally administer by putting the, nos the nozzle in someone's nostril. You have to hit, turn their head down a little bit like this and push the button, and that's, that's all there is to the administration of it. It's very simple to use. Um, the one thing to be aware of is that there's a tiny bit of liquid in here. It's really not very much at all. So you have to make sure the nozzle is in the nostril so that you don't waste it. Because if you push the button, then it's gone and you have to go this. So if you've got two doses of these, um, uh, when you go to the pharmacy, and it can be available at the pharmacy through a standing order, um, then there's uh, two doses. and so. You would administer the first dose, and I'm gonna show you how you administer naloxone, the um, generic naloxone. Okay, oh, let me start over. I would like everyone to open their pack, and what I want you to do is just move, take this orange cap, okay, take the orange cap and um, click it open. 
Do it for both of them. Because some of them can really stick, and if you're in the moment needing to use it, you do not want this to stick. Okay. Now, okay, so this part don't do, because you want to keep your naloxone. This is an expired dose. You're going to take the orange cap off. So because you want to get, this is a dose, and, you, and there's just a little bit of liquid, there's one cc of liquid, you want to get all of that into the barrel of the syringe. You're going to get a little help with that by pulling some air into the barrel, put the needle into, through the little rubber bit of the vial, and push the air up into the bottle. And what you're doing is creating a little compression chamber that's going to aid you in getting all that liquid out of the bottle. So once you've done that, you're going to pull the tip down and then draw it out. Okay. Now I'm sure you can't see this from where you're sitting, but there's a little bit of air at the top of my syringe. Uh, between, there's liquid and then there's a little bit of air. I don't care about that because I'm administering not in a vein, but in a muscle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to administer in right here. See if you can find your muscle in your arm. Yeah, you're going to administer the muscle here or your thigh. And you're going to do it through the clothing. And so it looks like, okay, you have a jacket on. Anybody sitting through here, you would just do it right through the jacket, not here so much. If you've got somebody who's got on a thicker jacket and you're worried, that needle is one inch. So if you're worried about it being long enough, just do it in their thigh. Wherever you have access, more easy access. So you're going to find the muscle in the upper arm or thigh, and then you're going to, with force, put it in there because you need the needle to get into the muscle tissue, right? I know that's hard to think about, but that's what you need to do. And the person is out, they're not going to feel it, so they don't care. Then you're going to push the plunger down, then you're done. So now here's the deal. This is now a dirty needle because you've, you've used it on somebody. You have, it's not a vein, but you have used it on somebody. So you need to treat it like a dirty needle. So what you're going to do is you're going to put it to the side, and then you're going to continue administering to the person who's had the overdose. Then when rescue comes, you can give them the needle, or you can dispose of it wherever you dispose of needles on campus. Worst case scenario is that you can put it in a hard plastic container like a soda bottle um, and dispose of it in the trash, right? But this, you want to make sure that you dispose of it properly, right? Okay, so you've called 911. You've administered naloxone. Now, the person may wake up, right? That's a possibility. They may wake up after one dose. And if they wake up, they're going to be, um, they could be a variety of things. Every single time they're going to be disoriented because they were passed out. So when they come to, they're not going to know what happened to them. You have to explain, you had an overdose, I gave you naloxone, rescue is on the way. Um, you, they, they could wake up and be alert. Very often, if it's a fentanyl overdose, they will not be alert. They're going to be groggy and really out of it. So they'll be kind of awake. You'll see they get color to their face. They're breathing more normally, but they're still really not with it. If that's the case, you'll see on your little cheat sheet that there, it has the recovery position, which is a person on their side. Um, and the reason that you do this is because if they vomit, which they could well do, because when you have given them naloxone and they've come to, and you've taken those opioids off this receptor, because that's what naloxone does, the person, could, if, if they are dependent on opioids, will experience withdrawal. So they could vomit both during the overdose uh, and more likely after, the, after they come to from the overdose, after you've given them naloxone. Okay, um, so rescue breathing. So remember, this is why I told you the person needs oxygen. So if you know rescue breathing, and if you feel comfortable doing rescue breathing, um, then you can give them breaths. So you've called 911, you've given them naloxone, and you can give them rescue breaths. 
and a, way, a handy dandy thing to have for that, which I am sorry that I can't include in our packs because we don't have the money to pay for it, um, but is this breathing mask. It's a one-way valve right here. You put this over the victim's mouth um, and then you can breathe through it. So basically, how, who, who's, who knows CPR? Okay, so one of the many people here, tell me how to do rescue breathing. And <laughs> Yes, okay, exactly right. So you're doing one breath every five seconds. When you, you, how you want to prepare the head, and this is also in your cheat sheet, you basically want to lay the person flat, tilt their head back because you want a, the airway to be straight. So you're thinking, I'm breathing for them. I need my breath to get into their lungs. Um, so you do a couple of breaths to start off with. You have to pinch the nose. Because if you breathe into their mouth without pinching the nose, the air is going to come out the nose. So you tilt the head back, pinch the nose, open their mouth, so make sure nothing's in there. You put your, your mouth over there, theirs, give a couple of breaths. What you're looking for is the rise and fall of their chest. That means your breath is getting into their lungs. Once you see that, then you're going to give one breath every five seconds. And you're going to do that for three minutes. Um, if you do not feel comfortable giving rescue breaths, don't wait three minutes. So the second administration happens two to three minutes after the first. So if you're giving rescue breaths, let your oxygen do some work and go ahead and wait the three minutes. But if you are, are not able to do that, a couple minutes later, give them the second dose of naloxone. And then so you would do uh, 911, naloxone, res rescue breathing. Two to three minutes later, more naloxone, rescue breathing, until um, EMTs arrive and they take over for you. Right? So does that make sense? That's right. So here's the deal. That's, thank you for saying that. So if they wake up, your, jo your job is done. But they need medical attention, right? So they don't, so there's a couple of things. One is they actually could go back into overdose because um, what happens, naloxone um, goes into the opioid receptors, it kicks the opioids out, and that's what causes the withdrawal, but it only lasts in the body 30 to 90 minutes. And so the, other, the opioids that kicked out don't disappear. They are waiting around to reattach to the opioid receptor. Now, as the naloxone dissipates, so are the opioids. So the vast majority of time, the person will, will have some relief from their withdrawal, but they won't go back into overdose. But if it's a long-acting opioid, like methadone, for instance, um, it is possible that they go into an overdose again. So medical help is really important. Not only that, um, there are multiple consequences to an overdose, not just death. So it's possible, for instance, I talk to physicians that say that the main reason people are intubated is because they overdosed. So the whole thing, if, person, if someone hasn't had oxygen for long enough, they are susceptible to a variety of problems, including brain damage, et cetera. So having medical attention is critically important. So this is um, administering naloxone, which we showed. Um, so this Evsvia, uh, this is um, a brand product. The thing is, is that uh, it, there's not a whole lot of it in Rhode Island because it's about $4,000 for two doses. Um, and there's not many um, insurance companies that cover it, understandably. Um, they are talking about reducing the price of that. We'll see if that happens. Um, this is the generic intranasal, this, this right here. And then this is the brand name which we talked about. Okay, we talked about rescue breathing. So all of this is in your, the cheat sheet I was telling you about. The recovery position. And this is the, um, this is the website that I was telling you, Prevent Overdose RI. There has, there's a lot of great resources here. So the other thing that I want to tell you about, um, great the other thing that I want to tell you about is um, 
that the naloxone needs to be stored at room temperature, which is basically 60 to 90 degrees. So you don't want to keep it outside, so you don't want to keep it in your car. Um, I keep my naloxone in my purse all the time. Um, so basically keep it to 69 to 90 degrees. So that is, so have, or do people feel like they could use their naloxone? So what I want to give you the opportunity to do is that if you are not used to, if you've never had diabetes or had a parent that had diabetes or had some reason to handle needles before, I welcome you to come draw up the naloxone in the vi from uh, these vials right here just to get some muscle memory for that. Um, otherwise, I would like make sure that everybody, I need a sheet of paper from everybody who um, took a kit of naloxone. And the last thing that we're gonna do is on the back of that sheet of paper, there's a little quiz. Uh-huh. So the, the vial, you take the orange tip part off, right? Yes, you take the orange tip part off, exactly right. Yes, for um, the, the medicine when you're getting ready to use it. Yeah, but for now, leave it on. I took it off. One of them off. Um, I'll look to see if I have another one here. It, it's okay. Um, it's actually okay, but um, it, yeah, 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 no, of course, that's fine. Um, it's fine, but just remember that it's still good. Yeah. Uh, you know, that it's, that it, even though the cap's off, that it is, uh, that's still usable. Do you okay. know what I mean? Um, this naloxone is, is good until February 2020. Um, so it, and if you have expired naloxone, and for any reason, let's say it's 2021 and all you have is this kit of naloxone, still use it. It lasts past its expiration date. If it's been stored at room temperature, it has, um, it, if it's ex exposed to extreme temperatures, it's going to lose some of its potency. So. I just want to make sure uh, some people are clear, when the heart is not Thank you for saying that. Because we're talking about breathing, but and where does the heart fit in there? That's right. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, so, uh, if you know CPR, so here's the deal: if you, what happens is when somebody's had an overdose, they're um, they need breath, and so if you can get to them right away, that's what they need is breath. But ultimately, they could have a cardiac arrest, right? Because that's the, one of the consequences of not breathing for prolonging for too long. So if the person has had a cardiac arrest, then you know CPR, you definitely want to use CPR. So you would check for their pulse, and you would administer CPR and integrate rescue breathing. Um, if you don't know CPR, Donna can tell you how to learn it. <laughs> So, the, so you would start off administering the Narcan first. With the heart not beating. Um, so if you come upon somebody, uh, so this is a really good question. So there's a couple of things. One is, is if it's not an opioid overdose, right, then you, right, naloxone is not going to help them, right? CPR, if they're having a cardiac arrest, CPR will help them. And if you come on somebody and you're not sure, the, the, if, the best the best trained you could be would be to have your naloxone, no CPR, check them for a pulse, et cetera. If you were, um, but given the amount to which we have opioid overdoses in our, you know, uh, hopefully not here on campus, but more broadly and certainly in Rhode Island, administering naloxone is a safe thing to do because if it's not uh, opioid overdose, you're not going to hurt them. And if it is an opioid overdose, you're giving them critically important medicine. But so what's the timing after the heart stops beating? Then you give them the naloxone, or you give it while you're trying to get the heart going? So it's what? It's getting okay. into muscular, not giving it to the mouth. So it really doesn't Right. Matter. So what if you come on someone who is unconscious? And they're, uh, and they're exhibiting not breathing, then treating their not, so giving the naloxone, calling 911 obviously first is important, giving them naloxone intramuscularly or even intranasally because it doesn't, they don't have to breathe it in, it absorbs through the mucous membrane. 
then you can address, you know, at doing CPR and rescue breathing, et cetera. If you assess that they have, if you know CPR and assess that they're having, uh, you've checked for the pulse and, and they don't have a, a heartbeat. Um, so let's do the quiz on the back. So what is the first question? Are there any of those sheets left? These sheets? No, okay. Oh, wow. Did we? Yeah, OK. OK. Um, so what are, what are ways, what puts people at higher risk of overdose, of opioid overdose? Mixing drugs, absolutely. What else? Using a little fatal overdose. Um, tolerance, being aware of tolerance. What are two signs of opioid overdose? Yes, excellent, very good. So they were not responsive, gurgling, slower, no breathing, um, and losing color, blue, pale lips. Um, so you see that number three has A, B, C, or D. Um, assuming that you're not doing a CPR or just focusing on rescue breathing now, A, B, C, or D is the most correct response. C, that's right. Um, and where do you administer naloxone if you're doing an intramuscular injection? Where do you do the injection? Arm and thigh, right? Um, and how long do you wait to give a second dose? Two to three minutes. Um, and then six, number six, what is the order of intervention? So, nine, okay, if at all possible, 911 administering naloxone at the same time, but if you're alone, 911, naloxone, and rescue breathing. And then A, B, or C is the recovery position. C, great. Okay. No, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where you administer the second dose. If you get Narcan, though, if you have the intranasal, um, this, you should give it in the second nostril. So first dose in one nostril, second dose in the second nostril. Um, yeah. Okay. So does anyone want to practice? Oh, yeah, sorry. So what would what would happen if you misjudged the signs and administered the naloxone and it wasn't actually overdose? What would biologically or chemically happen? So it would uh, it, the naloxone would bind with, will bind with the opioid receptors. It'll do that, regardless of whether a person has opioids in those receptors or not. And if there's no opioids present, you won't feel anything because there's nothing there except your naturally occurring opioids. Um, so it doesn't do anything. It doesn't help, but it doesn't hurt. Okay. Um, come on, nobody wants to try, wants to practice. Everybody here? Good. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you very much, and come down and practice. <laughs>